gentlemen, the story of the Tuskegee Airmen, an American story of the First Order. May we have lights, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have a forum afterwards. Please stay in your seats, and please do not uh, come up to uh, bother our airmen at this point. We're going to put them in front. We're going to discuss the uh, documentary, and we'll go from there. Ladies and gentlemen, how many uh, students here today? Please raise your hand. This is absolutely incredible. You are learning American history today that is told by folks who were there. It was told by the airmen in their own words. They put you in the moment. This is truly a special occasion because Unlike in many situations in this world, you're not getting the history from the books. You're getting it directly, unfiltered, from the people who made that history. And ladies and gentlemen, you're very, very fortunate here today to have three of the original Tuskegee Airmen here in your midst. Mr. Bush Conley was a gentleman who was here uh, who helped with Moton Field, who helped get things started, who has been not only a Tuskegee Airman, but a Buffalo Soldier. Let's give him a hand. Please stand up. Let's give him a hand. A Buffalo Soldier and Tuskegee Airman. Ladies and gentlemen, this is truly history. Truly history that you, our young people especially, are seeing here today. Ladies and gentlemen, next to him, Mr. Wilbur Mason from Tuskegee, Alabama, who was hired by the Tuskegee Army Air Corps and was the boss out there in the supply operation where everybody ordered all the parts and all of the equipment and everything to make the first black, all black Air Force Base run. Mr. Wilbur Mason, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely. Wilbur, we'll stand up. Let him see you. A Tuskegee Airman from Tuskegee who made things work so that everybody could prove their worth. And ladies and gentlemen, now the 93, I'm sorry, 94 year young Air Force officer who swore me into the Air Force as a second lieutenant and said, go forth young man and replace me in the Air Force. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Eugene Carter, an original member of the 99th, an original member who has made history and was the aircraft maintenance officer for the entire war to keep everybody else inside my airplane. And ladies and gentlemen, it's been 77 of your toughest missions himself. So he was a dual threat. You cannot do that in the military nowadays. You cannot do that in the Air Force anymore. There's a regulation against being an aircraft maintenance officer and responsible for a unit and also flying combat missions. They broke the mold when this young man left that position. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Carter has also spoken to well over 200,000 individuals at Air University at Maxwell Air Force Base. It is the University of the Air Force where everybody comes to get additional training and Colonel Carter has spoken to all of the classes graduating for many, many, many years. He also, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, has come and supported uh, Moulton Field, our Tuskegee uh, Airmen National Historic Site, as the others have, and he has continued over the years uh, to climb in an airplane when we could find one for him and fly. And I can tell you as a guy with over 6,600 hours myself, there's no way I would want a Tuskegee Airman on my tail. So when you see the Red Tail movie, Think of the guy who was back there putting it to them. Uh, Colonel Carter was one of them. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask that they uh, move their chairs up front. If somebody, if we can get some help to roll Colonel Carter up front and also have the other airman chairs uh, put beside him, we will have an open forum so that our young people, and especially our young, young people, can ask the Tuskegee Airmen to provide the wisdom of the ages that they have distilled uh, in their lifetime. Colonel Carter, I, I rise to a point of personal privilege. A point of personal privilege granted. Yes. This is too historic, ladies and gentlemen. This is too historic, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm going to ask you in lieu of our three distinguished, living, looking good, and handsome, <laughs> Tuskegee Airmen, I'm going to ask you to give them the loudest thank you, even if we knock the chandeliers off. Let's go. <laughs> We thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as was pointed out, this is truly a historic day. We have waited over 10 years for George Lucas, who came on CNN with breaking news. George Lucas said, Ladies and gentlemen, there are perhaps only six people in the world today in my business who can do a movie and tell the Tuskegee Airmen story and do it justice. He then paused and he looked in the camera and he said, and I think that I'm most qualified to do the best job. And he announced that he was going to do a big budget film, a widescreen movie of the Tuskegee Airmen. It has taken time, but ladies and gentlemen, the Red Tails will be in your theaters next to you, January 20th, around this nation. And I would ask that you and all of your friends and all of your church members and all of your classmates go out to see and support the Red Tail film. A little while ago, ladies and gentlemen, I mentioned how Colonel Carter and the airmen have spoken over the years uh, to carry on the legacy of the airmen in the military. Ladies and gentlemen, here this afternoon, we have three members of the NCO Academy class that is in place now. And I'd like for them to stand on this right side of me, this side of the room. Ladies and gentlemen, non-commissioned officers of the United States Air Force who are here today supporting uh, the Red Tails. Please stand. Give them a hand, ladies and gentlemen. And Colonel Carter will see you in class. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I'd like for hands to be raised, and then I'd like for you to ask questions. If you would, on my right, form a line, and any questions that you have for the Tuskegee Airmen, I would like to have you ask that question and then have the Airmen answer. Those of you who have questions, form on my right, please, next to the table. Remember, this is a very, very historic event. This has not happened in 68 years. So please feel free to come and ask your question and then we will go from there. Please state your name and your question. Um, and who you're directing it to. My name is Orlando Hale and I'm really directing this uh, to, to all three because I know that you are my inspiration for wanting to be involved in aviation and for choosing the major of aerospace engineering. And I want to thank you all for that because I've done 
countless reports and I've done, I've, I've looked at so much history on what you all have done and overcome. And so I want to thank you that personally for being my, my, my inspiration to want to uh, look at aviation as a career path. But what was your inspiration to, you know, get into a field that's, that's based in aviation? Colonel Carr, the aviator in the middle, would you answer that please? The question is, what, well, let me have you state it directly. Uh, my question to you is, what, what made you want to be involved in aviation? What made you want to be a pilot? What was your inspiration? Well, to be honest with you, uh, it was not the Army Echo. I was a student here at Tuskegee. My major was animal science. Tuskegee is known around the world for that. My ambition was to finish Tuskegee and go to President Patterson's alma mater and take veterinary medicine. The draft board had a different idea. They had a letter to me in November 41 that said, at the end of this school year, you're going to be changed from class F to 1A. Well, back in those days, 1A was the kiss of the death for us young Negro men, because we knew that meant you were going to be drafted in the Army, you were going to end up a private in the rear ranks, cleaning up cigarette butts on the grounds and doing other menial tasks. But you wouldn't get to go to officer's training school. And certainly it was out of the question to think about the Army Air Corps. But coincidentally, with this letter came word that our government in trying to fill that void between the lack of Air Corps officers and with the German and the Italian Air Force and the Japanese Air Forces had, they had gone around to all of the land-grant colleges and made an agreement with the presidents that any young man or woman two years of college, who could pass the physical, had a desire, could volunteer, and get flying training free on the campus at no cost to the student or to the university. Well, to me, it went click, click, click. <laughs> I said, I'm out. I'll go on and get my flying, get my private pilot's license. I'll go and get my DVM, and I'll come back and I'll go out to Texas, and I'll tend those big animals, large animals. I'll fly from ranch to ranch to ranch, <laughs> and I'll raise chicken, pigs, and children. <laughs> Thank you so much, Colonel Carver. Please, shake his hand and walk through and shake the airman's hand. Next, please. Uh, state your name and your question for the airman. Thank you very, very much. I want to say, first of all, it's, it's such a pleasure for me to be in your presence. And I want to say to these young folks here, you guys don't even understand the magnitude of this. Uh, I, too, am an alumni of Tuskegee, class of 83. I know yes. A lot of you guys weren't even born back then, but you know, most of y'all weren't born back then. But uh, for me, uh, I, I just lost my favorite uncle who served in the United States Air Force as an air, air mechanic, air, airplane mechanic. And my question to you guys and, and then to the rest of this, this wonderful young crew, uh, at some point in your life, I know there had to be something within you that clicked, that made you say that, uh, you know, I'm going to be in a history-making mode. Uh, you guys were around the same age. A lot of these kids are right now 
and right now you're sitting here uh, living history right in their presence. What advice could you give to these wonderful young folks now to let them to be groundbreaking historians in their own right going forward? Excellent question. Mr. Conley, would you answer that? Yes, sir. Anything for you. Um, the question I like is, is, is there anything, that, any kind of advice that you can give to these young people uh, who are now the same age you guys were when you uh, started your, your journey? Uh, what, hit, what advice could you give them to become historians in their own right today as you guys are right now? I'd like to say that uh, I pretty well follow the pretty well follow the rule of Colonel Carter. I came to Tuskegee University in 1940 to study architecture. But at the time when I, I mean, two months after I got here, uh, maybe a year, the civilian pilot training program was started there. It wasn't quite as the black colleges throughout the country. And this was an opportunity that I had always wanted to pursue, to learn how to fly a plane. I had visions of flying when seeing the air shows when I stood at the back fence of the Birmingham Airfield and before I came to college. And when the opportunity came at Tuskegee to do take flying, become a pilot, and was free, man, I just had to go for it. <laughs> So that's, that was my, that was my take on flying here at Tuskegee. I'm going to nail my phone, so. The president is calling, the president is calling. The red phone. Now, uh, advice. As I proceeded here at Tuskegee, I also got into the beginnings of the Tuskegee Advanced ROTC unit. Perhaps then, prior to the war, it was a junior unit. So I got into the senior unit, just beginning in what was called the active duty on my third year of college. And I had to go to Austin Candidate School after this training all to get, become a commissioner. But I too also served in Italy during World War too, but I was with the 92nd Buffalo Division in the mountains of Italy all the way up to Genoa. And uh, I was, we call it Buffalo Soldiers, but my path through the Air Corps really did not follow what I had in mind. And I had to go to the Army because that's what the Army said. But the opportunity, I believe, is to fly as, and back then, in the 40s, for a black man to have that opportunity with a chance of a lifetime. And that's what I pursued. And, and uh, that is how I uh, became, you know, because of those very people in sympathy. But, I'm saying, when you see, when there are opportunities, when there are opportunities abound for you, just go for it and, and say, if anyone else can do it, I can do it. If you want to do it, do it. Whatever it is you have in mind, a chance to do it. I, and I think that's it. Thank you, Thank you very much. Look at Conley, ladies and gentlemen. Please, shake his hand. And the next question, please. Your name and your question. I'm a mother of an alumni. I'm Roberta Crenshaw. My son is Yusef Crenshaw. He's had the pleasure for the last four years of hosting the Coca-Cola celebration in November for the airmen, and they've signed his picture. My question is, how did we as Afro-Americans support you during your time of this struggle, becoming the great people that you are? Mr. Mason, would you answer that, please? Well, uh, at this time, uh, there was a war going on, uh, just about to go on, in other words. 
And uh, it was just patriotic Americanism to support those servicemen, uh, you know, the war effort and whatnot. So it was just a patriotic duty that you would, you know, uh, accommodate them and whatever you could do to help them, or assist them, or encourage them. Thank you, Mr. Mason. And by the way, uh, war bonds were really big during that time. <laughs> And Tuskegee Airmen pictures were in fact taken and they were on war bonds that sold all over this nation. The nation supported the Tuskegee Airmen because they bought war bonds like you would not believe to help finance the war. Sir, please come. Your name please and your question. My name is Christopher McCall and my question for y'all is how did y'all feel living in the time that y'all did when you had to live and face racism? in your face. Colonel Carter, uh, give an idea of what it was like to live during uh, that time and you had to face direct racism uh, during uh, your training and during that period. The effect of racism on you all. Well, of course, it was very disappointing to find Americans who seemed to be against what you were trying to do to become capable of defending this country uh, with no apologies of the fact that you wanted to be an officer and you wanted to be a pilot. But uh, they were looked on uh, with great sympathy, really more than anything, that uh, they would be so prejudiced and deeply carried away in their feelings about a person that they would let that feeling interfere with the fact that this person was trying to prepare himself to be of greater value for his country than just a private in the rear ranks with all respect that there he is for that private in the rear ranks but was trying who become more, and uh, therefore uh, it was difficult to face up to the facts that prejudice could be a very deep-rooted thing that a person could carry around on their shoulders for years and hold it against you where you had done nothing whatsoever to create what they were pretending your being a Negro had generated. Colonel Carter, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, let me share, you, uh, share with you something that I heard from this man when I was a young student of his. This is the distillation of it. I quote, the antidote for racism, the antidote for racism is excellence. Think about that. The antidote for racism, discrimination, and things that you may encounter in life is excellence. And the Tuskegee Airmen, I guarantee you, were all about excellence. That has always stuck with me in my mind, and Colonel Carter told us that. He taught us that. And ladies and gentlemen, I have known, interviewed, been around over 400 original Tuskegee Airmen. I have not met one with a chip on his shoulder. And that started with General B.O. Davis, Jr., an amazing man who was silenced for four years at West Point, who did not have a roommate, no one to study with. He went through unimaginable difficulties and he still graduated number 35 out of 276 students in the class of 1936. That was the leader of the Tuskegee Airmen. He was the epitome, really the poster person for integrity in the United States Air Force when I came as a, as a young second lieutenant. So when I tell you that, it's directly from them. What Colonel Carter said is so true, and I repeat back today, that the antidote for racism 
is excellent. And I make sure today that for all the airmen, but especially Colonel Carter here, that I pass that on. Thank you. Next question, please. Your name, please, and your question for the airmen. And my question to you is, why did you fight for a country that discriminated against you? Well, so far as I was concerned, in spite of her imperfection, America was my home. It was my country too. And I was not going to let a few people judge as to who were and who were not qualified enough mentally, physically, and otherwise to be called an American. I had as much birthright as any other person born here on these hallowed grounds. And I demanded the opportunity to serve and protect my country and you and all the other Americans that were exposed to Hitler uh, at the time. And, and all of that came, really, the, 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 the apex to it was was not so much the end of the war, but it came in 2007, if you can imagine, when President Bush stood there in the rotundry in Washington, and he said for all of those Americans who were so biased and short-sighted that they did not see the grandness of what you were doing, I salute you, Tuskegee Airmen. And he put this unusual Congressional Gold Medal that I have around my neck that few Americans can wear. This is the Congressional Gold Medal. And it was given to the Tuskegee Airmen. And I don't know of another unit of combat size that participated in combat of any wars that the President of the United States presented to them in mass the Congressional Gold Medal. And I will be present. Absolutely. The highest honor that you can give in the peace time, the Congressional Gold Medal, ladies and gentlemen. Great question. Now, we have a future co-pilot for me. Would you please come on, identify yourself, and your question. And remember, I'm always looking for a co-pilot to teach the fly. What's your name and your question? Yeah, it's Yoni. And what's your question, please? Um, what inspired you from a bunch of soldiers to be coming to go back to war? Our Buffalo soldier has stepped out for a bit, but do you have another quick question? Okay, would you please shake hands with two of the original airmen here? This is history, ladies and gentlemen. The young meeting the younger. Please, your name and your question. Hello, my name is Queen Agamacy, and I'm just, first of all, very thankful and grateful that you all came and provided us opportunity to meet and greet you to watch this beautiful documentary and my question for you is in addition to the fascism and the racism that you all had to overcome what were the other adversities and how did they help to mold you into the wonderful leaders that you are today excellent question oh, okay the adversity well, uh, I, it is, uh, the old saying is it takes uh, four or five, I uh, know, 10 or 12 people on the ground to keep one in the air. <coughs> so I was not a pilot. Colonel Carter was a pilot. I was a support crew, one of those 10 or 12 people on the ground to, you know, support him. And uh, let's see, now I forgot your question. <laughs> In addition to fascism and racism, what were the other adversities that you all had to overcome 
and how do they mold you into the wonderful leaders that you are today? Well, I don't think any of the Tuskegee Airmen per se would say that we are making history. History came as a result of their uh, experience and uh, confidence and whatnot, you know? And uh, we were just doing the best job we could under the present conditions and whatnot. So as far as making history or something, that never occurred to us. This is an afterthought, and we appreciate it. Colonel Calder, would you like to come in on that also? Well, uh, it, it's a hard question to answer because uh, there were so many fragments that, uh, that come out of uh, racism and come out of discrimination from education to public transportation to public facilities to all that uh, was supposed to be open to any person that were not. And uh, our hope was to demonstrate that all people here were people and simply give them an opportunity and a recognition for what they did do and would be able to do would be advancements in that, that we could overcome some of the misconceptions. And I wanted to blame misconceptions more than prejudice of, uh, for what some of the people were feeling and thinking that they could be re-educated and, and retrained to come to appreciate and respect the fact that what we were doing was for their good as well as our Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we only have about five more minutes, so we're going to move it quickly, and I'll do a summary. Your name and your question, sir. My name is DeAndre Fuller, and I just, I didn't really have a question. I just want to thank these men, because um, we grew up in two different times. Because of the great things that you did in fighting the war, I didn't experience that severe racism. It still exists, because I've experienced it as I've gotten older, but it's nothing like what I see on the video or what we read in the history books. And it is truly an honor to meet you. So, yeah, that's it. Shake the hand of the Your question and uh, your name. My name is Tori Sisson. I'm a history major with an animal science minor. And um, I, I thank you, and I want nothing from you but your words and my memory and to give you my admiration and respect. And if I may ask, from the 1940s to 2012, do you feel that we have progressed enough as black people from the legacy that you began? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, we, we have. We, we're moving along. May not be fast enough for some people, but we are progressing. And the whole idea, every time we fill a room like this with this young spirit and this young blood, and we get 15 or 20 percent of you being determined that you're going out of here and you're going to make education your top priority and you're going to make life and all of its values your priority then uh, we, we we're still doing well as a group in trying to change the face of america absolutely next question your name and your question hi my name is amber toller and um, i'm an animal science major and i was wondering over the years when you men were fighting, or when you were in the Mill Air Force, you have been called lazy, cowards, and white men were, um, were considered better or better fighters than you. But do you believe that we have proved the Air Force, the military, and all of America wrong? No question. That's why we're sitting here today 
That's why you're going to see a movie that's going to show America what was done. That's why now in America you are at Tuskegee and you uh, don't have to apologize for whatever there might be. If you decide you want to be a veterinarian, you can go right to Tuskegee as a veterinarian. Uh, now you can go up to Auburn as a veterinarian. I couldn't. You can do so many more things. Uh, George Wallace can't stand in the schoolhouse for <laughs> against any of you. And uh, you can predetermine right now what you want to do, where you want to have your supper, uh, where you, what motel you want to go in. Uh, your life is a free bud. Thank you so very much. One uh, question, go ahead. Name and question. Hello, uh, my name is Charles Keys. I'm a freshman here at Tuskegee University. Uh, my major is mechanical engineering. My question to you guys, I know you guys had to deal with a lot of negativity, you know, when you were going through not only being in the war, but having to deal with the segregation and stuff along the lines with people of your own team. So my question for you is, what did you guys use for encouragement to keep a positive mindset during a time of so much negativity? Well, you were born into a situation and uh, you have to do the best you can with it, you know? And uh, we didn't want to be, you know, have to cut a bad seats, including one top gun at the airports, 
and two instructors at the Top Gun Navy School, and a number one graduate of uh, Navy College. And these are the folks that have made that possible because they are inspiration and because they were our mentors. Now, what I call the five P's of success that we learned from the Tuskegee Airmen, I'm going to pass on to our young people today. So if you have a pen or pencil, do it. Number one, always have a plan. Always have a plan. That makes you think about things, that makes you think about what ifs. If you get in trouble, you have an idea of what direction you should turn in uh, to make sure things happen, good things happen. Ladies and gentlemen, to the young people, that plan in the military is called a mission. And in the military, you don't have to worry about it because you support the mission of your unit, of your group, of the headquarters, and of this nation. The second thing is be prepared. Preparation. The Boy Scouts have it right. Be prepared. For those of you who are in school now, this is the most important job that you have. Preparation, putting in place the great foundation that you're going to use your entire lifetime. So be prepared. Hit those books. Get the best grades possible. Make sure that you are ready for anything as the Tuskegee Airmen were. So that preparation is absolutely important. The next thing, and this was talked to me by Chief Anderson and the Airmen also. Whatever you do in life, develop a great passion for it. Whatever it is that you want, develop a passion for it. The passion that you have will smooth out the bumpy road that you encounter in life. Believe me, the passion will let you roll out of bed when it's 33 below at Goose Bay, Labrador, as I was as a young officer up there. And I'm a kid who came here at 16 from Mobile, Alabama. 33 below was so far beyond me, I couldn't understand it. But in my Air Force, my passion for wearing that uniform and doing well, based on the example of these folks, made that possible. So you have developed that great passion. The next thing I want you to understand is that you have to persevere in life. Things don't always come the first day, the first night. You are not always the first one picked for the basketball team if you're four foot three. Ladies and gentlemen, if you persevere, if you have, have a plan, if you prepare yourself, if you have that great passion, when it's time for you to persevere, you can hang in there in the current vernacular of the day. Let other people give up. Let them give up. Don't you give up on your dreams and what you have to do. Hang tough. Make sure that you let the other guy give up. So when opportunity does come, when opportunity does come, in the words of General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., who said this, when I was a youngster here, your performance is your measure of merit. Your performance defines you. Your performance goes ahead of you as your reputation in the military, in life. It's the way people know you, the way people respect you. And believe me, even if someone does not like you, they will respect you if you indeed perform. So, those P's of preparation distill in just a few words things that we in the second generation learned from the Tuskegee Airmen experiment and Tuskegee. Number one, have a plan. Number two, make sure you have a great preparation, a foundation. Number three, develop that great passion for what it is you're going to do. Number four, persevere. Hang tough. Do what you need to do to be ready so that when opportunity comes, believe me, you get the opportunity to perform so that you set the bar. General Bill Davis, Jr. was a disciplinarian who set the bar up here. The Tuskegee Airmen got over the bar. Don't ever bring the bar down. I learned that as a commander on four occasions. Set the bar high, demand excellence. Americans will get over the bar and they will surprise you as the high high the bar is that they raise and they leave with you. Your Tuskegee Airmen are that example. Ladies and gentlemen, give them a hand as I invite the mayor of Tuskegee to come up 
and to say hello. On behalf of Tuskegee University, uh, Dr. Rashawn was here earlier today, and we have a gift for you, Colonel Carter. Mr. Mason got his in the first session and has already been wearing his. So thank you, Colonel Carter. And Colonel Lewis, from, for you, we have a gift, and we want to thank you for being with us here today to moderate. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will not have autographs. We have a public forum uh, and some publicity pictures outside that the airmen must do before the folks leave. So please, thank you so much for coming. And I turn it over once uh, again to the mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama, this great historic place, Mayor O'Neill. Isn't this a wonderful day? Yes, Isn't this a wonderful day? Yes, Isn't this a wonderful day? Yes, you know, we all are Tuskegee. The whole world is Tuskegee. And we are so pleased to have these men and the women of Tuskegee, Airmen, to be recognized after so many years. You know, Tuskegee is not just a place. Tuskegee is a spirit. And it's a spirit of excellence and it's a spirit of service. And it's when excellence and service marry, then live forever, is where you see the personification of that in the spirit of the Tuskegee Airmen. Let's give the Tuskegee Airmen a round of applause. We encourage each of you to go to the movies on the 20th. Don't buy the bootleg copy, right? Let's go to the movies on the 20th and wear red in solidarity with the struggle and the spirit of the Tuskegee Airmen. We thank you so very much for being a part of it. Welcome to Tuskegee, Alabama. Thank you. Mayor Omar Neal, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Ladies and gentlemen, this truly has been a historic day in Tuskegee, Alabama. It's been a historic day in the nation. Remember, this is not a black story or a white story. This is an American story of the first order, and that is the way you should pass it on. Get everybody you know to the Red Tail movie. Let them learn what you have learned here today. If you would, stand by just a bit inside. We need to get the airmen out to uh, uh, a location and uh, we will see you in just a bit. If you would, stay inside for just a bit until we get the airmen in front of their appointed rounds. 